Well, we want to make sure the people that think that it's going to start at 11 get on first. <laughs> okay, good morning. It is 11 o'clock, so uh, we'll start, uh, first of all, with a few announcements. Um, this week, the office will be open Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I think it'll be open Tuesday, but Dave's not here, uh, so you'll have to talk to him. Uh, there will be no one in the front office, but if you need to come in and either drop off your offering or pick up bread, uh, we're going to try and make sure that's all taken care of for you. Uh, no senior lunch Thursday, uh, because of course our seniors, uh, they're the ones that are most uh, fragile when it comes to uh, what's going on in our country today, and we just feel as though right now we're being safe, which of course brings me to my next point. Uh, this morning, of course, we're not having church here. Uh, thankfully, we do have a couple of visitors, so I can at least talk to them. Uh, but um, we have chosen for cautionary purposes not to uh, meet this week. Uh, that would mean youth group tonight, uh, church tonight, Awana on Wednesday, uh, adult Bible study on Wednesday. We're not going to be doing any of those. And it's just so that everybody can feel safe. Um, we're not run by fear. Now, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of uh, love and of power and of a sound mind. And so uh, as we're meeting today uh, via Facebook Live, we would ask that everyone would take into consideration how they might best be a blessing to those around them. Uh, went shopping yesterday, and uh, obviously this scare has affected a lot of people. Uh, hopefully, if you have need of anything, if you will let me know in the office this week, uh, I will see how we might best be able to help you, especially if you can't find it at the store, uh, because, wow, a, a lot of shelves are empty. And again, it comes down to people operating in fear, feeling as though they have to hoard things when uh, we don't need to do that. We can just be loving one another. Our president has called today to be a national day of prayer, so for those of you that know the Lord Jesus Christ, please uh, consider taking some time out today and praying, knowing that uh, uh, God is the one that is in control of all things. Uh, he is the one that has allowed this to be a part of our situation at this time, and again, there is no reason to fear. For most people that uh, are subject to this disease, it is a matter of a cold, a flu. I'm not trying to undersell this thing. I recognize that for some, it's a pretty serious thing. Some have died. But for those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, if that were going to be the case, first of all, you're not going to be here a day longer than God intended. Your days are numbered. He's written them down in a book. And you're not leaving a day before He intended. So for us, when that day comes... We're going to close our eyes on this side, and we're going to open them up in the presence of Jesus. I'm just not sure why that's such a problem. I know it's not something we've experienced before, and therefore, uh, but we don't need to. Amen? Well, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we will be talking about the submission of the husband to the wife as he loves her. Let's pray. Father, as we come this morning, we do thank you so much for your wonderful love, your wonderful care, your mercy that endures forever, uh, that is new every morning, and your loving kindness that, is, uh, that endures forever. As we consider uh, the text this morning, we would ask, Father, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the things that you have for us, and that we might become doers of your word and not hearers only, that we might uh, show forth uh, the character of Christ in our family relationships, and that we might uh, experience the joy of living in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you, that it might make a difference in our uh, marriages, that the world would look on and see that truly we have something that they need. We ask all that, you, all that we do in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, our scripture reading today is uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33a. So if you'll follow along in your Bibles, I am reading from the 
Holman Christian Standard Bible. And it starts with, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, hates his own flesh, but provides the church. For this reason, flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself. Now this passage is found, of course, after Ephesians 5.18, and our uh, total series here is being a restored human. Uh, The subtext here is saving our children and living a shared life. Uh, I have appreciated what Pastor's been talking about in this area, and uh, we skipped over verse 22, though we touched on it last week, uh, 22 through 24. Uh, He'll be getting back to that when he comes back from his vacation. But the submission for the husband, why the husband needs the Spirit's completion, or if you will, his filling. Well, what is man like in the first marriage? everybody else, but I know that uh, when I got married, I was pretty sure my wife was getting a good thing. Uh, He thinks he is the prize. Proverbs 18.22 says, whoever finds a wife finds a good thing. Oh, that's talking about the wife. Well, yeah, just because the Bible says it doesn't mean we have to change our thinking, right? (laughs) Uh, Men are relatively self-oriented. And to be honest with you, men are relatively pretty clueless on nurturing relationships. Now, if there was a crowd here, we could probably ask what other things might be true about men in the first stage of marriage. And I'm sure the list would be very, very long. And of course, the women that were giving us this list are not talking about their husbands. They're talking about someone else's husband. But The next thing that we need to grab a hold of is, what does the next stage look like? Well, after a man has sown the seeds of selfishness, thinking that he is something, and not really understanding how to nurture a relationship, somewhere in the rush, what you sow is what you're going to reap, and so he's going to start reaping the fruit of his actions. So the second stage of marriage, well, the husband usually doesn't understand why is she complaining so much. I mean, I bring home a paycheck, I buy her things, isn't that good enough? He also feels like giving up trying because there is no pleasing her. He may also uh, start to understand that his communication skills have yet to develop. He does not understand how to talk to her in a way that they actually can communicate, and so there's lots of frustration. So that's why a husband needs the Spirit's filling or the Spirit's completion. The Scripture does give us an example of what the husband's submission is to look like. In Ephesians 5.25, it says that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, let's think about that for just a minute. Christ, the eternal God, God the Son, lived in heaven. At the right, he uh, was co equal with his Father, with the Spirit of God. Uh, Was there a reason to leave? Well, in God's mind, there was. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son. Somehow, God creates life in the womb of this woman without the procreative process, and Jesus becomes a man. He takes on flesh. He lives a perfect life, enduring all of the things that we might endure here on this earth, and yet he is without sin, 
And he's done all of this, why? So that he might lay down his life. He says in John chapter uh, 10 that no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down for the sheep. And truly he uh, is the good shepherd. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, it says that he, uh, we're to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and, be, uh, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance of man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So he gave himself for her. He left the glories of heaven to become flesh. He laid down his life. Now, why did he do this? Number two here, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing by the water of the word. The word sanctify, it means to make holy, to purify or consecrate, to venerate, to hallow, to be holy, to sanctify. Now, I, I don't know about uh, many of you as far as how you feel sometimes, but uh, God has positionally sanctified us. By imputing the righteousness of Christ to our account, when God looks at us, he sees Christ. He says, my son, my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. The issue is, is that's positional. What about our practical? Well, in day-to-day -day living, Oh, the need for forgiveness is still there, isn't it? We fall all over the place. Uh, Paul even says in Romans chapter 7, the things that I'm doing, I don't understand. I want to live right, but I do the very things that I hate. And so we see that though positionally we are sanctified, practically we are in the process of God making us holy. He uses trials. He uses husbands. He uses wives. He uses children's. He uses uh, children's. Uh, that was pretty good. He uses bosses at work, uh, co-workers. All of those things he is using to sanctify us, to make us more like Christ. Romans chapter 8, 28, a uh, verse most people know, God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And uh, 29 goes on to say that he does this to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. So that is the process of sanctification. He's already positionally sanctified us, and now he is making us holy in our practice through the very things that we go through. He also did this that he might cleanse us. The word cleanse here is to cleanse, to make clean, to purge, to purify. And uh, again, positionally already done. But when we come to Christ, there are things that need to be laid aside. There, there's got to be a change in our thinking. And we need to be putting on righteous habits that uh, uh, replace or uh, we substitute those righteous habits for the bad habits that uh, we've had from the past. So we see here in Ezekiel uh, 36, 25, and 26, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthy and from all your uh, filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. See, within the cleansing, it's by the washing of the water by the word. Uh, in the new covenant, he is telling Israel that he is going to clean them. He's going to sprinkle them with water. When we come to John chapter 3, uh, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Most people think that the water here is the water that is in the uh, uterus with the baby. Uh, the reality is, is God's not talking about that. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so uh, J Jesus is making reference back to the Ezekiel 36 passage where he's going to sprinkle us with water. In John 15, 3, he says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Imagine that. The word comes in and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 
So within that, we are cleaned. And then through the process of sanctification, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about looking into a mirror uh, darkly. We're, we don't get to see the whole picture yet, but we're seeing the glory of Jesus Christ. And then Romans tw chapter 12 verse 2, we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we might uh, prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His Spirit, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And of course, Hebrews 10, 22 tells us, Let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, all of this is not referring to physical washing, but spiritual washing done by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. And it is something that happens positionally at the time of salvation, but it should continue to happen so that uh, as we fall on our face, uh, we are cleansed. 1 John 5, 6 says... This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. So he came to sanctify, to cleanse by the washing of the water by the word. Another uh, part of the example of Jesus Christ is that he may present her to himself a glorious church. The word glorious there is in glory, splendid, noble, glorious. Hot, here's one for you. Gorgeous or honorable. And not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The idea of spot is a stain or a blemish, a defect, disgrace, a spot. I, I know when I eat spaghetti, I like to change my dress shirt into some t-shirt because if it's red somehow it's going to end up down here i don't understand the whole thing and of course my tie is without spot at this time so that's good <laughs> uh, but it goes on to say uh, uh, without stain uh, or wrinkle the word for stain here is a stain a blemish a defect disgrace or spot the first time this passage made sense to me i was thinking to myself Knowing how I was, knowing so many other young Christians and the struggle that we see in Romans chapter 7 is kind of like, how on earth is he ever going to do that? Because it seems as though there are some things that, man, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to win this battle. And the reality is, is obviously since then until now, uh, I've done a, hopefully a lot of growing and I have won a lot of those battles. But this is something that he is going to do uh, because of what he has done, because of what he is doing. He has started a good work in us and he is going to fulfill it until the day of Jesus Christ, at which point we will be ultimately sanctified. Sin will be removed. This mortal puts on immortality. This corrupted puts on incorruptibility. And so this is something, again, that he is going to do. It goes on to say not having spot or wrinkle. Well, for those of you that know, today is my birthday. At 1020 this evening, I will be, wow, 60 years old. <laughs> and uh, I have developed a few folds or wrinkles, or if you will, as drawing together, and the wrinkles are usually considered to be on the face. Uh, he is going to present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Notice it goes on to say that uh, she should be holy and without blemish. The word holy there is sacred. In the physical sense, it's talking about pure. In the moral sense, it's talking about blameless. In the religious sense, it's talking about consecrated. It means most holy one, most holy thing. It's the same word that is used for saints. Uh, when Paul writes to a church, he's writing to the 
uh, leadership and to the saints that are in the church of Ephesus or in the church of Philippi, things like that. Anyone who has been born again has been made holy. They're a holy one. They are a saint. And of course, he is still working on that process. The second word there is without blemish, means unblemished, without blame, blemish, fault, spot, faultless or unblameable. Imagine that. It's, it's the idea, again, the idea of a legal not guilty. It, it's not that we're not guilty, but Christ has died for that thing. And so the case is dismissed. Not only dismissed, but we are declared righteous in that whole situation. And so that is the, a part of the example that we see of what Christ is doing for the church. Notice it says in verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Uh, this is uh, what he has done for us. In Romans 12, 5 it says, So we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Uh, it's kind of funny uh, on Facebook, someone was saying, hey, just for fun, how many rolls of toilet paper do you have? And of course, my last shopping experience two weeks ago, I bought a box at Sam's. This is how we do it. Uh, Rachel and Travis and their three boys are living with us and my wife and I. So I buy this big box of palm uh, t toilet paper, 45 rolls in a box. And I think it costs $27, $28, $29, something like that. Uh, it's a relatively good deal. I've been buying bulk for years because we had five kids. But uh, so I, I just went in and looked and counted. And between what was left over from the previous box and what was in that box, I basically still had 45 rolls. So I posted, well, we have 45. Now, it was all in a joking type situation, but if you're down to your last roll, please uh, give me a call. I'd be more than happy to share that with you. <laughs> be, why? Because we're one body. Okay, we're members of his body and uh, we need to be loving one another. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 6, 15, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Then I take uh, the members of Christ and make them uh, members of a heartless? Certainly not. Uh, so, again, God is taking this whole thing serious as far as us being his body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. I don't know about you, but that members individually, that kind of rings uh, real clear in my mind. I've thought for years, you know, if everybody else would just do their part, things would be a whole lot better. And then I started to understand that, there's the first half of that too. We're the body of Christ. You know, we need one another. Th this idea of not having it, hardly anybody here. I do have uh, three people here today. But the idea of not meeting, that we can just watch it on Facebook Live, that's wonderful. Uh, the scripture actually teaches we're not to forsake. Now, today we're not forsaking. We're doing things for a reason. But some people, this has become church for them. They just watch it. And if you're a, a shut-in or there's a reason why you can't be here, please, no reason to feel guilty, but you are missing something. You're missing the encouragement that can come through good relationships, through interaction with other people. And uh, it is important. We need one another and not just for toilet paper, okay? Uh, we need, I have been rebuked by people in this church and I have grown because of it. I've had opportunity to lovingly do the same for others. And it's important. Uh, scripture says that a, a wise man loves the one who rebukes them. And you sit there and say, say what? Well, why does he love them? Because he can be wiser still. And that happens when we're together, when there's interaction, uh, interaction with one another. So we're the body of Christ, though we are members individually. He goes on to say that this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The idea of a mystery is it's something that had not been revealed previously. If you go into the Old Testament, the church is not spoken of. The Old Testament is for Israel. What many people do not understand is when Jesus 
uh, is dealing with an awful lot of things in the Gospels, though he knows about the church, obviously because he's God, he is speaking under the old covenant. He is speaking to people who are under the old covenant. The new covenant, if you will, doesn't really start until about Acts chapter 2. The church starts in Acts chapter 2. And a lot of the things that are said really don't have direct correlation to the church because he's not talking to the church. It's not that there is an application that we can gain from it. But, for example, in the Gospels, Jesus talks about the tithe. Many times uh, with the promise that if you do, do that, God's going to give back, shaken up, stirred and patted down. And wow, you're just going to get a whole lot more in return. When we come into the New Testament epistles, what does it teach? It does not teach a tithe. It teaches give as you've been given unto. Now, there are times when uh, that may be returned many fold in this life. But it may not, because it's not about this life. It's talking about laying up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. Again, that doesn't mean that if a person's rich on this earth, there's a problem. God's just blessed him. That's okay. Okay? So with that in mind, there's the example. The church, the body of Christ, how he is dealing with her, how he has dealt with her, is the example that men are to follow. So that brings us to letter C what the husband is called to do and be. Uh, the word submission very often is used to describe the wife's responsibility to the husband. As Pastor has pointed out already uh, in last week's message, submission is a hard attitude that is for all believers as they are completed or filled with the Spirit. Uh, it is not just the wife to the husband, but the husband is called to love his wife. He is called to submit to her, if you will, her needs. Okay? And so with that in mind, number one, love just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Matthew 10, 39 says, he who finds a, his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake, we'll find it. Matthew 16, 25 says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, with that in mind, what does it have to do with the price of beans in China? Well, again, the whole idea is what you sow, you're going to reap. If we go back to what that husband is like when he first gets married, uh, whose life is he concerned with? His own. He is self-oriented. He thinks he's the prize. He's clueless on nurturing relationships. Even later, he doesn't understand why she's complaining. Uh, he uh, feels like giving up because there's no pleasing her. Uh, his communication skills have yet to develop. And so with that in mind, when we're looking at Christ's example of loving the church, what do we need to understand? Well, a lot of people like to talk about agape as being God's kind of love. And though that is true, we need to understand that Jesus talked about the, uh, the Pharisees agape, the praise of men. See, they were willing to do what was necessary to get something. So that's agape. Well, the reality is when you look at God, what is he uh, doing so that he might get something? He doesn't need anything. So it's not a matter of doing to get. It's a matter of a self-sacrificing love. Uh, agape could be described this way, doing what's best for the other person without a consideration of the cost to oneself. So when a husband is loving his wife, he's not thinking about himself. He is thinking about what's best for her, to helping her with her needs, uh, her desires, not considering the cost to himself. Now, as soon as I say that, we're going to start talking budgets and stuff like that. Uh, look. Let's talk about the house, for instance. Uh, two of my children have recently uh, put offers on houses. As far as I know, uh, everything will go forward and they will have homes. And uh, my uh, daughter is already picking out five or six different colors of paint. 
I don't know if you've bought paint lately, but paint's getting expensive. <laughs> and, and as the husband that's a little bit more budget oriented, I'm sitting there going, <clears throat> um, and, and I'm, I'm sure that might be the case of her husband also. Uh, but the reality is, is who is the head of the house? Now, the immediate answer, most people are gonna say the husband, not according to the scripture. The husband is the head of the wife. But according to, uh, I believe it's Titus, the woman is the despot of the home. Hmm. See, that is her realm, if you will, to rule. So what should the husband be doing? When it comes to our budget, he ought to be doing whatever we can to take care of her desires and needs, but not running his budget into the ground at the same time. Can we agree on that? Okay, but in self-sacrificing, he's not going out to get himself a new tool so that it can sit with his other tools. He is doing what's necessary to help her uh, without the consideration of the cost to himself. In Colossians 3.19, it says, husbands, and, and this is in a parallel passage to this one here. There, instead of saying, be filled with the Spirit, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. After that, you'll see all of the signs of the word of Christ dwelling in you richly are basically identical to being filled with the Spirit. It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Now, why on earth would a husband be bitter toward his wife? Can we go back to the section about what a husband is like when he first gets married or, or even the next stage? See, she puts a crimp, you will, if you will, on his self-oriented lifestyle. And that's, it's what God designed because it needs to be crimped. It needs to be changed. And it is through the marriage relationship that God helps him come to a point where it's not about him. If it was, well, then uh, obviously everything is going to be messed up. But uh, is there a reason for Christ to be embittered against the church? If you think about the way we live sometimes, there would be all kinds of reasons for Christ to be embittered toward the church. But the reality is, is he has forgiven he is in the process of sanctifying. He has sanctified. He will complete that sanctification process. And so we are called to be just like him, to act with a self-sacrificing love and not to be bitter toward our wives. That is how we can do that. Number two, according to 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Husbands likewise, again, the context is submission, and the first six verses were talking to the wife, submitting to her husband, but even before that in chapter two, it's talking about submitting yourselves one to another. Here it says, husbands likewise dwell or live with them, the wife, with understanding. Now, uh, it's a joke, and I'm sure it's a very old joke, that women cannot be understood. But obviously, God says, do it, therefore, it must be possible. But if you're going to understand one who is so different from yourself, what is it going to take? It's going to take time, and it's going to take study. Let me see, how much do us men like to study? Well, if you're talking about reading books and stuff like that, for the most part, I don't find men are really liking that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know there's the occasional guy that likes to read, but the reality is I do a lot of book studies with my men on Thursday nights, on Monday nights. Why? Because I'm trying to make them read. Why? Readers are leaders. It is good to have input from other people uh, and get outside of your own head for a little while. <laughs> a lot of talking, no water, my fault. No coronavirus, too. <laughs> so we are to dwell with them uh, according to understanding. It goes on to say, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, immediately someone's going to say, why does the woman get six verses and the man only get one? Well, probably because if he had six, he wouldn't read them all. How's that sound? 
But the reality is, is this says a lot about a husband loving his wife. First, he's going to dwell with her with understanding. He's going to be taking that time. He's going to be studying her. He's going to be seeing how things work, what works, what doesn't work. And that may change in six months, so he's going to continue that study. Now, that, that's not to say anything negative about her. That's just to understand how things are. And so he's going to be taking that time. It goes on to say, giving honor to the wife. The idea of giving honor is, I, I like watching uh, old Chinese films, uh, even some of the more modern Chinese films with the martial arts. Everybody's, you know, bowing and showing honor, especially to the elderly. But the reality is, is the idea is you're giving them the position of honor. You're not taking the position of honor. So you're giving honor, honor to the wife. Notice it says, as to the weaker vessel. Well, I like to work out. And I can tell you that if you go to the gym, there are some pretty strong women working out at the gym. They got their muscles, and, and whether or not they're taking anything, hey, between them and God, don't care about that kind of stuff. Whole point being is, though it may include physical weakness here, the word is talking more about the concept of being fragile. Now, uh, uh, most women right off the bat are going to uh, take uh, offense to that, but I want you to understand, this is the idea of a woman being like a crystalline vase, a crystalline vase, yes, it may chip easily, but you wouldn't put it in a place where, you know, people are going to be hacking swords around here and there. You'd put it in a place of protection, a place of honor. Uh, a guy, you know, we're kind of like an old clay pot. Now, we don't have it here, but if you go down to Mexico, you go down to Brazil, they have stands all over the place where they've made clay pots. And they're relatively cheap. No offense intended, guys, but let's face it. Uh, you'd use a clay pot to uh, haul water. You'd use a clay pot to clean out your septic system if you had to. But you wouldn't use a crystalline vase because it is something of value, something that is fragile. You wouldn't want it to break. So that's the idea here. You're giving her honor as to the uh, weaker vessel, the finer vessel, if you will. Uh, we always talk about uh, our better half. Uh, I, I hear occasionally uh, women talking about their husband being the better half, and that, of course, is uh, not true biblically. <laughs> it goes on to say, you're giving her honor as being heirs together of the grace of life. And here comes a cup of water. You can bring that right up here. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. We have some good servants in this church, and I do appreciate that so much. It says, uh, giving honor to her as being heirs together of the grace of life. Now, think about that. The grace of life. God's life being shared by grace with people, both in salvation and in the empowerment to live a life that's honoring to him. And we are heirs together. In other words, there is neither one better than the other. They're both equal. Uh, a lot of people today talk about how women uh, can be pastors and stuff like that. And I, I challenge you, if you go back to Galatians chapter 3, where it talks about neither male nor female, bond nor free, it's not talking about ministry, it's talking about salvation. Um, as, as far as women being pastors, could they be good pastors? I'll, I'll tell you this, I think they'd probably be better than most men. The reality is, is it comes down to that's how God made them. They're nurturing. They're, they're caring about other people. That is part of their nature. But God didn't call women to be pastors. God called men to be pastors. Why? Well, think about this passage. What is a woman called to do? She is called to do something that because of the curse is contrary to her nature. The curse says... Uh, your, your desire will be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. In the next chapter, God says the same thing to um, Cain. He says, sin's desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. So the idea of being for you is the desire is going to, the natural tendency, if you will, is going to be that women are going to want to run things. 
But men are called to do that in being the head over the wife. Not because they're better, but because it's contrary to their nature and they need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do it in a way that's honoring and pleasing to God. Men have been trying to keep women in submission for years without the empowerment of the Word of, uh, of the Word of God or the Spirit of God, and they've been doing a horrible job of it. One of the reasons why feminism has made such a headway into the church. The reality is, is God said, and from there you can come to conclusions. Uh, so it's not a matter of women not being able, it's a matter of what does God say about the subject. And so here we're heirs together with, of the grace of life that's dealing with salvation and all that's included in that. It doesn't mean that she can't uh, be uh, of service within the church. Uh, I would say that uh, there's a good place for women uh, if they're going to have the title of pastor as far as with children's ministries. Or, or how about in the youth group? Uh, there's lots of young ladies in the youth group. They need input from a more godly woman. That's Titus chapter 2. Not just talking about older women dealing with younger women, but uh, there might be a place for if you're going to have multiple uh, leaders in a youth group, where women ought to be there. Uh, but should women be preaching from the pulpit? Well, if she can be the husband of one wife, I imagine she... Well, let's just forget that for the time being, okay? <laughs> Whole point being is... Heirs together of the grace of life, not necessarily of all of the ministry opportunities uh, within the church. It goes on to say here uh, that we are to, uh, the men need to do this. Why? So that their prayers may not be hindered. I don't know about you, but I think prayer is one of the more difficult um, disciplines of the Christian life. And, and I think the reason is, is because you really got to be nuts to think that you can pray to God. The thoughts and intents of your heart. He knows everything. And if you're going to talk to him, if I withhold iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. So obviously I've got to be dealing with these things. I have to have confessed. I have to be keeping short accounts. And when it comes to how I live with my wife, at least in the first several years of our marriage, praying was difficult. Why? Because I knew there were things that still hadn't been worked out. And you can't just go to God and talk to him uh, about everything. Because if you're not willing to deal with some of those things, uh, brass sealing is the good uh, response to that. So uh, men need to be careful that they are dwelling with their wives with understanding, giving honor to them, etc. Um, there is another passage that talks about how men are to love their wives, uh, rendering to his wife the affection due her in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. It says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, this subject right here, First of all, we hardly ever talk about sex in uh, church because, <gasps> you know, that kind of a thing. The reality is, is the Bible has an awful lot to say about intimacy within marriage. And I'm going to try and keep this as clean as possible, uh, knowing that I may have a mixed audience. But let's understand a couple of things. The husband does not have authority over his own body. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body. What it does say is they're not to deprive one another except with consent. Now, obviously, most women are thinking, well, the guy is never cons uh, going to consent to uh, stopping for a little while. This is one of his areas of expertise and all that kind of stuff. Uh, not talking about that. Uh, back in the days of the pilgrims, there were actually laws on the books uh, that if a husband was not taking care of his wife in this way that she could bring him up on charges 
And the whole point was they were chasing after some form of uh, religion uh, and they would get so caught up in it that they wouldn't take care of their responsibilities to that relationship. So with that in mind, let's understand there are responsibilities within this re relationship between husband and wife. When it comes to this subject, let me see, are men giving or are they self-oriented? And the reality is, is at least the stories that I hear, men are relatively self-oriented once again. And so when we talk about this subject in loving his wife as Christ loved the church, we're going to be dealing with the idea that he is there to deal uh, with her needs. Not that his can't be taken care of, but that's not going to be his thoughts. That's not going to be his emphasis. His emphasis is going to be, how can I best take care of her? So, um, again, one of those subjects that, ooh, let's not talk about that uh, and all that kind of stuff. But the Bible does, so we need to. Uh, notice it says, we're not depriving one another except for consent for a time, giving yourselves to fasting and prayer. But you come together again. Why? So that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I do my share of uh, marriage counseling here both pre and uh, post marriage. And uh, to be honest with you, like so many pastors today, I think I'd like to have about three weeks of premarital counseling. And after they've been married for about six months, get back together and cover the things in a little bit more detail, just because when they're getting married, uh, yeah, yeah, we got that. We, we got that. We're just planning the wedding, you know, the actual event. And they're not really hearing what all of us know to be true about marriage after the fact. Marriage after the fact? Well, first of all, it's until death do you part, <laughs> okay? And second of all, there are times when you want to kill the other person. Uh, it, it can be difficult because you got two sinners that want what they want. James chapter 4, we would have been speaking on it tonight. We'll save it for the next time. But why are there conflicts and, and fighting between you because you both want what you want? You're not willing to think about the other person. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, they were in conflict and they were going to secular courts of law suing one another. And Paul says, you should have just taken the loss. D don't go before a, a lost and dying world. When we're going to be judging angels, we can't take care of these things. Uh, so again, the whole point is uh, it, young people... You know, a few pre and then post after they've gone through some of the difficulties and then trying to help them uh, sow better seeds so that they're not reaping corruption, if you will, would be a good idea. But uh, in marriage counseling, I don't know how many times I've met with people that there has been no intimacy in their relationship for however long. And usually, because there's been no intimacy, someone falls in that area. And everybody's surprised. Why? It says right there, so Satan doesn't tempt you. Why? Because of your lack of self-control. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is there because those things do not exist in us without the Spirit's empowerment. We're not patient. We're not loving. We're relatively selfish. We want everything right now. So when we come to the area of self-control, yes, I understand some people might be a little bit more disciplined than the others, but the reality is, is especially in this area, it's obviously an issue. And so it, it surprises me when they're surprised uh, when the Bible specifically teaches. Another thing that a husband is called to uh, do or be is he is to love her as his own body. It goes on to say, for he who loves his wife loves himself. And it goes on to say that no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nurtures it and uh, cherishes it. Now, uh, this may be uh, proved in our understanding of the man flu or the man cold. Uh, you all know that a man cold is somewhat equal to a woman, a woman given birth, right? I, I, I know you women doubt it, but it, it really is the truth. See, men love themselves so much that a little bitty cold coming into their life, they go off the deep end and how they're going to take care of themselves and all that kind of stuff. And, and 
you don't even have to go to the cold. Just how do they take care of themselves? Uh, when it comes to tools, I, I like tools. Uh, do you only need one hammer? No, you actually need several uh, because if it does, if the small one doesn't work, you want a bigger one. And if that one doesn't work, you want a bigger one. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. But when it comes to things that we want, we have a tendency to buy and buy and buy and not think anything of it. Well, the reality is, is that is a sign of us loving our own selves uh, or loving our own body if it's dealing with food or those kinds of things. It says uh, we're to love our wife as our own body. Now, going back to Christ's example, we are the body of Christ, and he loves his body. He takes care of it. He sanctifies it. He cleanses it. He makes sure that uh, it's washed in the water of the word. Why? So that he can present to himself a wife that's even better. And so he who loves his wife loves himself. Uh, going on, the word nourish there is to rear up to maturity, to cherish or to train. So we see that one of the husband's job, like Christ, washing her with the water of the word, is he is going to be having input into her spiritual growth. By the way, she will probably have more input into his at the beginning, but later on, he might actually have more than uh, she does. Uh, the second thing there is uh, he cherishes his body uh, to brood or to foster, to cherish. Uh, the idea is he's very watchful, he's taking care of, he's cautious about. And so if he's going to love his wife like his own flesh, uh, he is going to care about it. He's going to uh, be aware of what's going on and trying to help her. There are times when uh, my wife uh, gets a little overly involved and when she does it, it kind of stresses her uh, she needs time uh, first of all for herself with the Lord but she needs time to put her lessons together and uh, think about all the ramifications and she's serving in nursery uh, on the third uh, Sunday junior church on the fourth Sunday she helps with uh, teaching Sunday school and so she needs time to develop all those things and sometimes she'll take on just a little bit too much or she'll say no to something and uh, she she's worried about what people are going to think and I try and come alongside and help her understand. Look, if you feel as though that's too much right now, you are not responsible to the other people. You're responsible to God. So that's what you got to do. Whether it's because you have to watch grandkids or uh, prepare this lesson, you've said no. You know what you can handle. Deal with what you can handle. And so that's the idea there of cherishing. Number five in our outline, to establish his own interdependent family. Now I specifically use the word interdependent because in today's day and age independence is what everybody talks about when in reality we still need input from parents, uh, from brothers and sisters, from friends and things like that. So verse 30 and 31 say, uh, since we are members of his body, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, I put in uh, Christ's example, we're members of his body, because when it's talking about leaving his uh, mother and father, uh, the word there is to leave down, to leave behind, to abandon, to forsake, to leave. Uh, the idea is he's not hanging on to the apron strings of you if you will of uh, mom constantly going to mom and again uh, one of those things that I see in marriage counseling so often uh, the wife comes in and complains because the husband's constantly going to mom and there, there's nothing wrong with going for counsel and things like that but if mom has become the major part of the relationship instead of wife then he is not doing uh, what he should be doing so he's not only to leave mother and father, but he is to join, uh, be joined with his wife. The word there is to glue to, to adhere, to cleave, to join oneself. Because of our passage in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5, and this, I got online and I looked up a few things as far as the emotional, psychological uh, benefits of intimacy in a marriage. And the reality is, is, there are hormones that are released 
during that intimacy that join you together. They glue you to the other person. And I think women, they, they uh, have a tendency to operate under the uh, cause of that hormone a whole lot better than men. But the reality is, is it e even works with men. It is the same hormone that is released when a woman is giving birth to a baby. Interesting. One of the complaints of men after that new baby comes along, she cares more about him than she does me or more about her than she does me. Well, no, it's the way God designed it so that she would nurture and cherish that kid and bring that kid up to, it doesn't mean that you're not important, but you got to understand the kid can't take care of himself. You can, that kind of a thing. But uh, it also is uh, the same hormone is released when a, a woman is nursing her baby. Again, it, it joins them together emotionally, psychologically. Well, intimacy in marriage does the same thing. And this whole idea of uh, depriving one another just provides for that opportunity to go elsewhere, even though you are joined together. The two shall be one flesh. One of the reasons why divorce is so hurtful. A and again, I know Christians that have divorced uh, I know Christians that have divorced a couple of times. And, and the, the hardest thing about that is I believe we have the answers. But as one counselor uh, doing premarital counseling out in Kansas City said to my son, when we're dealing with the individual, there's a 78% chance that they're going to listen and that they're going to change. When we're dealing with a couple that percentage falls all the way down to about 17% because they can blame the other person instead of recognizing they got to deal with their own junk. And we have the answers, but it's due to the hardness of our heart that we won't listen. Uh, God has joined you together. Let What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But again, establishing his own interdependent family. That is what men are called to do. Our conclusion is found in uh, verse 33a. This mystery, uh, excuse me, uh, to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself. I know the verse goes on, okay? But that's talking to women, and today we're not talking to women. We're talking about men submitting themselves to their wives by becoming the man that God has called them to be and living like Christ's example laid down in Scripture. Now, with that in mind, it really doesn't allow men to continue on with any kind of thinking that uh, we might call uh, machismo. Uh, in the Spanish, uh, where it's, it's uh, macho, okay? Uh, it calls us to be like Christ, to have self-sacrificing love, to look out for the needs of the wife, to study her, to take time and learn so that we can be dealing with her from a point of uh, maturity, from a point of knowledge, and that is all going to reflect uh, God's glory as we are being completed by the Spirit. Well, with that in mind, I would ask if there's any questions, but there are so few people here, I wouldn't get any. <laughs> so if you have any questions, you're uh, more than welcome to give me a call at the office this week. Other than Tuesday, I will not be in the office. So let's close in prayer. And again, let me remind you that uh, the president has called for today to be a national day of prayer. Uh, so be in the process of considering how can you be praying for those that are ill, those that could easily become ill, uh, how you're going to deal with one another uh, so that we might continue to show forth the love of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, as we come once again this morning, we are thankful. Your plan is good. Your plan works every single time we do it the way you've called us to do it. Lord, we are a selfish people, especially as men. Women are too, but today we're talking about men. And with that in mind, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to our own failures, our own selfishness, our own love of self over love of neighbor. 
and that you would give us grace to be corrected by your word, to be transformed by your word, and Lord, to be doers of your word. I have found that not only is a wife a good thing, as you have said, but you have used her mightily in me to grow me up. I pray, Father, that you would give us grace to recognize the wife is one of the tools in your hands to make us better men for your honor and glory, and that we would find ourselves submitting ourselves by loving, by understanding, by meeting the needs of the one that you have given us. Thank you again for your wonderful love and care for us. Pray, Father, that you would give each one of us wisdom when it comes to this coronavirus, uh, how we're affected by others, how we might affect others, and that we would uh, be cautious but not fearful so that uh, we might show forth the love of Christ to those around us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, uh, there will not be Wednesday evening service this week or Sunday night service today. Uh, so Lord willing, uh, we will not have to call you next week. Maybe we'll be back together. If not, the messages will continue. So we will see you uh, soon, I hope. You are dismissed. <laughs>